in the two and a half thousand US dollars price category or less, the two cameras that has the potential to confuse most people are the Panasonic Lumix S5 II and the recently released Nikon Z6 III. Now, clearly, for the Z6, it's Nikon's third iteration of this body. It's Z6 III, and for Lumix, it's a second iteration. So, they're comparable in many ways, primarily because they almost share a similar sized megapixel sensor, which is 24. Also, they're really heavily invested in video with these two bodies. Now, Panasonic has always been that. Panasonic have always been the company that focuses really heavily on video. Nikon traditionally have been a photo photography brand, but off late in the last two and a half years, I think they have made huge strides in high-end video. So I want to begin first with stabilization. The Lumix S5 II is clearly better in stabilization, not just because it's smoother, but also because it shows a little less jitter when the steps are made, when you're like when a foot is hitting the ground. It's a more walking friendly stabilization overall on the Panasonic, whether you use the mechanical IBIS or you use the electronic stape. There are two levels of electronic stabilization on the S5 II versus only one level or one option on the Nikon. The standard mode of e-stabilization on the S5 II is good enough and gives quite a natural feel to the image. Also, it doesn't crop in quite as much as the high uh, e-stabilization. It's got standard and high. The high e-stabilization is very smooth. It's almost gimbal-like, okay? But And it's also very, very walking friendly, even on rough and uneven surfaces. But it crops a lot. The S5 II, when you set it to uh, e-stabilization high, it really crops a lot. I mean a lot. It becomes an APS-C camera essentially with high e tape. So does that mean that it impacts the dynamic range? Well, watch the video till the end and you'll, I'll show you how the S5 II's killer stabilization actually impacts the overall dynamic range or not. <clears throat> now the Z6 III stabilization has the brute power of a very good mechanical stabilization machine inside the camera. But somehow it feels less refined, less kind of, it has less finesse. With wide to normal lenses, the Nikon tends to either fight the natural movement or kind of tries to overcorrect for it. But I think Nikon should spend some time to make the stabilization sync more nicely with the movements, especially with panning movements. The problem is that it starts to look a bit jittery or a bit inorganic. You know, when I was editing the video, I had more time to look through the clips. And when I did that, I actually found that the Z6-3's E-IBIS, along with its mechanical IBIS, together, it performed really well. Um, so, initially, I came into this review thinking the Panasonic will just completely dominate the Nikon in terms of stabilization. However, I have to say that there is a little bit of, let's say, jitter that I saw in Nikon's mechanical only IBIS, especially when hard stops were made. When I actually looked into the clips, I realized that the stabilization overall is almost like standard e-stabilization of Panasonic along with Lumix's own internal IBIS. Now, I think it's somewhere in between standard and high of Panasonic, which is really, really a good performance. And I showed it to a few friends of mine. So when I played both clips to them, they thought both clips are from Panasonic. And then, <laughs> so overall, I, I talk about finesse in the Z6 III, uh, not only relating to the IBIS, but also relating to the autofocus. Therefore, when you get to the part where I discuss autofocus, have a look at that. I still stand by what I said for autofocus. But... I think the whole finesse discussion of um, the kind of stabilization the Nikon Z6 III now gives you, I think that's irrelevant. I think Nikon's EIBIS EVR is almost as good as Panasonic standard uh, EVR plus mechanical um, IBIS. And I was quite pleasantly surprised. It's definitely better than Z8. And I think it is also more refined than that of the ZF. But make no mistake, as you saw, the stabilization on the Z63 is so good, I think nothing from Sony comes close. Also, I don't think anything from Canon comes close to this one. The R5 
2 we have to see how that does now since we are on the topic of finesse or that level of sophistication let's talk about autofocus when i shot a few portraits with this lumix 85 1.8 lens this is a beautiful lens by the way the autofocus was good but it didn't feel super fast it was problem free and it was okay you would never feel that you're inhibited or you're kind of your um your road is blocked by the autofocus you'll never feel that the z63 autofocus is just much faster it feels quick when you're using it an interesting twist happens when you switch to video the lumix s52's autofocus shifts are always more gradual and more sure in the sense that it chooses to focus on whatever is at the center and close to the camera it it's not confused it knows okay that object seems to be closer to me that object seems to be in the middle of the scene let's focus on it it knows what to focus on and it slowly gets to that focus point the good thing is that it will do that even when the subject is actually a thing or an object without a face or an eye the nikon is amazing with subject detect but hold a pen in front of it and it just refuses to focus on it my a7 IV also picks up the object in front of the camera quite nicely but the nikon does not so i wanted to put a led right in front of it and see how it performed in that sort of backlit situation mostly backlit situations and we did autofocus on the subject a few times but it was still inconsistent so the z60 video so the z60 video autofocus must be problematic right wrong if you touch the screen on the camera and ask the camera to focus on that object on the pen it immediately does it without fail repeatedly but leave it alone and it will not do it any further so it's clearly the software telling the system to ignore what's in front and at the center it's not a capability issue it's a choice that's being made inside the camera its algorithm is telling the camera telling the hardware what to do and it's choosing to not focus on the pen i think nikon needs to sort of allow the camera to focus on things without face or an eye meaning a pen or a ping pong ball or a piece of tiny button or an sd card i mean nikon should change this with a firmware update and allow users to do it without even without having to touch on the screen the low light autofocus of both these cameras are i mean it's crazy good practically focuses with no light so there are a few more things that i want to talk about before i get into the dynamic range test especially for video the lumix can do open gate 6k it can do full sensor readout and it makes it easier for it to crop out both horizontal and vertical videos in edit but the nikon does not have open gate the s52x not this camera but the s52x can record to an ssd that's such a good thing to happen to the panasonic users i feel that all brands should uh, open that up i think it's quite possible to allow uh, the camera to record externally it all most cameras already do that on a ninja so i think it should be shouldn't be a problem technically speaking to record on an ssd and i am looking forward to a time when the nikon cameras do that because we have such massive raw files on the nikon so the z9 z8 and the, now the z63 i think all camera brands should open that up let's talk about dynamic range now look I recently tested the Z63 against the A74 and the R62 and the A7S3. The Canon R62 has blotchy shadow shadows in highly contrasty scenes. It's just not me. You can find many creators say this. Even Peter McKinnon talked about it and he said that the original R5 has that blotchy shadows. Gerald Arnan also talked about it and said that said similar things that the R62 has only 12 stops of dynamic range because of C lock 2 and that's got a limitation on the other hand both the Sony's had smooth low light high iso performance but both applied noise reduction abundantly and so it that resulted in sort of a change or shift of color what i wanted to see with the lumix is how it balanced both noise and color shift in high iso situations i also want to see if the fabulous stabilization actually makes you lose a bit of dynamic range when the camera is essentially cropping into the sensor so let's get into it for the log files from both these cameras i have done a log to rec 
Gamma 2.4 conversion and boosted the shadows up by 34 points out of a range of 100 to just show what kind of noise visibility uh, is there in the shadow areas. Okay, what I see is that in high rises, the Lumix colors gets a bit cooler. Like if you go from ISO 640, which is its base ISO, right up to uh, 12,800, 25,000, and 50,000, you will see the overall scene is getting a bit cooler. That's not problematic at all. They seem to be not doing a much aggressive noise reduction at that high ISO levels, which allows the noise to look, actually look nice. The Z63 RAW files have a slightly more visible noise at higher ISOs. ISOs higher than 12,800. 12,800. Because the end row does not apply any noise reduction in camera. And that's why you see a bit more noise reduction, a bit more noise. But the good thing is that now you have control. So if you do all of that uh, management of noise reduction and managing the colors in post, you'll get much better uh, and cleaner image. Overall, both cameras are doing a fabulous job here with high ISO performance. <laughs> really impressive by both. However, the Z63 has an advantage because it shoots raw without any interference in the camera. Interference meaning overcooking with noise reduction inside the camera which allows the NRAW files to give you more detail and color accuracy, honestly, in the final edit. So, does the S5 II have dynamic range hit with E stabilization, especially in high? Oh yes, the difference in noise is quite visible at ISO 4000, ISO 12800 and 25600. The cropped in image of the S5 II actually loses a lot of information. So, you need to be aware of that when you are shooting with the S5 II with the high E stabilization on, which is also a great way to stabilize any footage. Now this point onwards, almost everything tilts heavily in favor of the Nikon Z63. The Z63's photo dynamic range is limited somewhat in the ISO range of 100 to 640. Starting ISO 800, however, the Z63 dynamic range still basically matches all the cameras in this price category. In exchange for that slight loss of dynamic range between ISO 100 to 640 in photos, what you get is 6K60 RAW, 4K 120 with a crop, 1080 to 40, all in 10 bit, and the RAWs are, of course, 12 bit. It can do N RAW, ProRes RAW, ProRes HQ 10 bit photo 2, and H265 10 bit photo 0. So many options. The Z60 has only minor rolling shutter unlike the Lumix. The S5-2's rolling shutter is less than the A7-4, but it's more than the R6-2 R6 and definitely more than the Z6-3. In photo, the Nikon autofocus is really fast. It feels very fast. It feels very smooth. Um, it also is optimized for fast shooting and fast action photography. The Z6-3 can do 14 FPS in mechanical shutter and 20 FPS with e-shutter, with very minimal whopping, uh, almost no whopping. Lumix can only do 7 FPS in mechanical shutter. So the benefit of that partially stacked sensor is so, so, so much more, honestly, than what you're losing in that little bit of dynamic range. So much so that it makes total sense to go for the Z63. The Z63's EVF is also a class leading one with it. 4000 nits bright wide camera EVF with much higher resolution. The Nikon has many more custom buttons and that this particular thing of custom buttons, I found it to be um, a bit of a problem on the S5 II. I wish the S5 II had many more custom buttons. Also, because I'm new to the system, I found the S5 II a little difficult to set. I also felt as if the camera is not designed for photography or to be a hybrid camera. It just felt like photography is an afterthought for the S5 II. Now, the Nikon has many custom buttons and that photo to video switch here really works like magic. And I, it, I mean, I was using the S5 II and I understood how good uh, this photo to video switch is. And you have separate settings saved in photo mode and in video mode. It's just amazing. It's just so convenient. So when it comes to operating these camera bodies and just the ease of usage, the Nikon is much better. The Nikon also wakes up 
uh, almost instantly when you switch it on. The S5 II will take a few nanoseconds more. So like I said, the Nikon is a tremendous photo camera for sport shooters and wildlife shooters. The Lumix is not just there in terms of speed and ergonomics, especially in photography. Overall, the lens options on the Nikon seems fast compared to the Lumix. However, Lumix has a set of similar sized and weighted lenses uh, designed for video and designed for this camera to be used with a gimbal. This 85 1.8 is one of those lenses. So basically the 35, uh, 50, 85, even I think the 100 uh, macro, all of them feel the same. They're of the same size and weight, uh, which is very easy. I mean, it just makes it very easy when the camera is on a gimbal. It makes it very easy for you to quickly change these lenses. So that's one thing that's going for the Lumix, especially when it comes to lenses. Now, if you talk about the system, the Z6 III can be paired with the Z8 to give you an unbeatable combo. But you don't have something like that on the Lumix system, at least with the current camera. The more pro bodies on the Lumix system is, are actually older now. And I think the system is expecting new cameras, but there's not much conversation on it. The raw video is stunning from the Z6. It looks natural and organic with a green structure that's just nice and fine. You have all the control in the world to reduce noise in post and then yet retain correct correct colors and details. Now since the Nikon does not crop in any video modes except for 4K 120, the Nikon is actually does not lose the benefit of it being a full frame camera, especially in video. It gives you all the dynamic range. But the Lumix has that 1.5 crop uh, in 4K 60 and becomes almost like a micro four thirds camera if you also apply stabilization on top of that. So one has to remember that that you throw away so much information when you're using 4K60 and stabilization together. That's something to always remember. Also, of course, the focal length will change and you have to adjust for that. So if you're in tight space and you, you were using a, let's say, 35 millimeters lens, maybe with 4K60 and, um, and with stabilization on, you're at 70 millimeters now. You're practically, you're shooting style will change the look of the scene will change so those things are something to keep in mind the nikon z63 is a clear king in wilder video because of the stabilization with long lenses and the range of light affordable long lenses and also the autofocus animal autofocus and well the bird eye autofocus is something that's mid missing in the z63 and i think nikon should really push a firmware i think i heard that nikon will eventually uh, send us a firmware that will add the Z9 and Z8 bird eye autofocus and I think this camera will benefit a lot from that. The Z60 also has this top screen which is really nice. I really like that but the Lumix S52 has this you know rear dial which you can use very easily. I, ideally I want both on both cameras but then if I have to choose one I would rather go for this. I mean I, I really like a third wheel just much more convenient you know it, it, it's just faster while operating the camera if you have another wheel so i'm i'm waiting for the day when nikon will actually make bodies with the third wheel at least uh you know on the back of the camera that's going to be cool so in conclusion i would conclude this in a different way the z63 is a well-rounded hybrid camera that need a few minor fixes however it belongs to a more mature comprehensive and complete ecosystem. It has a better hardware base that can take some firmware goodness. So this camera can improve. The S5 II is a beautifully well-baked camera, so thoughtfully, so thoughtfully put together by a brand that doesn't yet have a comprehensive hybrid mirrorless full frame system in terms of lenses and other recent bodies. Panasonic also seems to be working heavily on the smaller sensor cameras like micro four thirds, so maybe their attention is divided. I don't know. Panasonic's focus on photo market is negligible. It's like they have an sort of an understanding with Leica and they've said Leica, you do the photo thing and we'll take care of video. The upgrade path from the Lumix S5 II investment is not really clear. What else can you get when you want more within the system? Or when the market matures and the standards of cameras get better as you see happening with the launch of the Z63. Are these other bodies 
coming and if they are coming then when are they coming on the other hand nikon and red joining hands together gives every nikon user so much to look forward to in terms of future upgrades and future upgrade path and also firmware upgrades and fantastic image quality the question is do you want to spend money on a raw new talent that can get better with a bit more finesse with maybe a few firmware updates or a well-rounded mature talent who's kind of hit the ceiling of what it can do but what it does already is fantastic so that's the question i'm leaving you with uh, if you've enjoyed this video like the video and subscribe to the channel help me reach 6000 subscribers i'm going to see you soon with another one